I come from a marine perspective, as Fritzi said, and while I absolutely agree with everything that was just said about <coughs> invasive uh, species and the, the fact that <laughs> they really aren't, um, I have to at least defend my friends <laughs> who are innocent in some respect, ecologists in the marine environment who became extremely alarmed when they saw <coughs> ships coming in, dumping their ballast water into estuaries, and the, um, the, the result was a, a massive change of species composition in those estuaries. So they were, they were really alarmed. I will also say, oh, and, and another, another friend who became alarmed because aquaculture from place to place to place in marine environments brought with it new species that sort of spread and took over. They were alarmed. But they are equally alarmed with, at the response to, to in what are called invasive species. They were hoping that people would start thinking, gee, maybe we shouldn't dump all these species into new places. Maybe we should control our activities so that we prevent <coughs> them from getting here in the first place if we can. Uh, but no, the response was not that. The response was to just go out and kill whatever it was that we happened to, to have dumped into a place that took over. And as I said, they are equally alarmed about that. So. Um, so I, in thinking about um, invasive species, and I'll just call them that because that's what they're called, I don't like to think of them that way, um, it, it is odd that uh, people seem to think of their own lifespan, and if it was something that wasn't there when they were a kid, then it becomes an invasive, it's, it's a new and invasive species. But what kind of time scale is that? I mean, that doesn't really mean much biologically and, um, and ecologically. Oh, OK, here we are. Thank you very much. OK, so I've gone to some non-biologists, actually, for a little bit of inspiration. Um, uh, Elizabeth Sartoris. Um, has some, some wise philosophical words about, about life and the development of life on Earth. One species, they, she says, one new upstart species has appropriated the entire planet to itself. Now, who might that be? <laughs> Why is the only species with so much capacity for hindsight and foresight so destructive? Let us be brutally honest with ourselves, for if we are the only ones to change things, then we must look squarely at ourselves. <laughs> and this is, in fact, the most invasive species on Earth, right here. <laughs> and, okay, let's look at ourselves. What are we? We are a species that moves around. That's what we do. And when we move around, we carry things with us. And nobody is saying, oh, let's stop moving around, which would stop some of this. But we're not saying that, so if we're not going to say that, if we're going to accept ourselves and how we are, then we have to accept the fact that species are moving, they're moving often with us, we are changing ecosystems spe so that species that we bring with us can move into these places and succeed very well. And it really is uh, an evolving process. I mean, evolution of life has done that, species have spread around. Uh, some have disappeared, some have, have flourished at different times. We are changing the climate, we are changing the global, the whole global um, environment, so we cannot expect everything biological to stay exactly the same as it is. And by going out and killing everything, we're going to end up with nothing. Um, so, that, so that is uh, something that we really need to do is face ourselves, what we do, understand ourselves. Now, how do I change this? Sorry. This one? Oh, this one. Okay. Um, and again, uh, Elizabeth has said that as far as I can see, she can see, in other words, uh, every healthy living being 
or system in nature has evolved survival-oriented behavior. They want to live. So that is uh, hardly something to object to if a species is doing its best to become successful. <coughs> I have to, to, uh, I have to say that I actually <coughs> also suffer, I also am guilty of uh, wanting to get rid of some of these um, invasive species. You may have heard about our stink bug invasion on the East Coast. And they're pretty obnoxious. And I go around the house and I throw them in the toilet. <laughs> uh, but I do not spray them with chemicals. And I do not try to do anything beyond that. And uh, one encouraging thing is that in fact, they have the sort of official word on these is don't spray pesticides all over them. It won't do any good whatsoever. They'll kind of uh, go away eventually, or at least uh, calm down. So very often it's fear that, uh, that leads us to these, wait a minute, if I, oh well, um, that leads us to these, <coughs> conclusions that we need to get rid of things and the ability and we have um, we've decided to make ourselves the judges of what species are worthy and what species are not because as was pointed out very often we're putting species in that we want such as the oysters on the west coast uh, and those are fine those invasions are perfectly fine um, okay so again looking at uh, Elizabeth Saltoris, and, and some inspirational words, I believe. Nature, as we have said before, is far more like a wonderfully resourceful artist than a grand engineer, more like a mother juggling family needs, economics, and conflicts than like a coldly calculating geometer. In the improvised dance of nature toward order and balance, complexity unfolds, becomes chaotic or fragmented, is reorganized to new unity, then permits new complexity to unfold, new disorder to arise, this evolving system of life protects what is stable and works well, yet is never open to change, ever open to change when instabilities arise, using change to create both new unity and new variety, variety that gives nature, among other things, the resilience to survive disasters, which I think kind of sums up what, what it has been said. You have change going on, new things happen, and it's a dance of nature, and hopefully we just allow it to uh, become something beautiful rather than killing everything and making it something ugly. <coughs> And very often change itself will create that fear, and that's why so many people are often sucked in by this uh, line that we must uh, fight what's happening, the changes that are happening. Uh, change, change in ecosystems is caused uh, by or, or Excuse me, I didn't mean change, but the, sh the shape of an ecosystem, the, what the, speci the species that are there, the biodiversity, what it looks like at any one time, is caused by a number of things, including the age of the ecosystem. Some are young and have plenty of room for other species. Some are older and have high biodiversity, and those tend not to accept new species very well. Um, the geomorphology of a, spa of a, of a place, uh, will determine what can live there. I'm thinking in terms of green ecosystems, the shape of an estuary, for instance, uh, the geology, the chemistry, the climate, catastroph catastrophic events and their frequency, um, changing boundaries among species. All of these things are moving <coughs> and changing in time and space. And we should not uh, worry, worry so much about the consequences of change. And others advise us to get a sense of place, and I think that that may, in fact, guide us to a better acceptance of ourselves, our own role, and our understanding of what is happening in nature around us as 
we change it and as natural changes occur. And it's not just to see, oh, this is how it was when I was a child and this is how it should always be, but to understand the, the fluctuations that go on and to really be part of it, because we are a part of it. Terry Tempest Williams tells us that beauty is not optional, but is a strategy for survival. And she goes on to suggest that fragments of things can be put together in very beautiful ways. And when an ecosystem changes, it, it may become fragmented, but it may come back, it should ultimately come back together into a more beautiful, into a beautiful structure that may be different than it was before. Oh, okay. Well, then I'm just going to sort of go through this. Doesn't take long. And I'm going to skip on to the solutions that people have come to, which is chemical warfare. And because I worked so long on marine pollution, I, I'm particularly offended by this response. Uh, Rachel Carson very wisely said, as a crude as crude a weapon as caveman's club, the chemical barrage has been hurled against the very fabric of life. And that seems to be, in fact, what's happening. It becomes, no, it becomes more important to kill everything as long as you get that one thing that you're after. And in fact, that one thing usually will come back. You cannot kill something completely. Um, but you might lose a lot of other things, or at least harm the health of the ecosystem in the process. And the precautionary, the precautionary principle, which may sound sensible, um, in, oh, excuse me, this is, this is a quote from a science journal, new, The New Scientist, which says that employing the precautionary principle may sound sensible, but the indiscriminate eradication of aliens is not only unwarranted, but could even have detrimental <laughs> effects. Well, the precautionary principle is not going out and killing things. The precautionary principle would say, stop, don't bring them in in the first place. Once you have, once they're there, then we must uh, really adapt to them. Um, and I guess I really probably need to uh, end with this. A lot of the reason, this is from Dove Sachs at, the, at Brown University, a lot of the reason we've been afraid of exotics is because we are so well adapted for a lot of human modified conditions and because they have been able to spread so rapidly. But these are the same reasons why these species might provide benefits to humans in the future. Thank you.